Yeah. Thank you for uh, taking the time to come out again. Um, for those of you that, that don't know me, my name is Jake Byler. I've been a part of these monthly meetings for quite a while and uh, just always love connecting, collaborating, learning with other people. Uh, I've made lots and lots of connections at meetings like this, and I've learned a lot of things that have been super valuable uh, for me over the last 10 years or so as a real estate investor, as a business owner, and even just life in general. Uh, just curious, how many of you guys are here for the very first time? A couple of you. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for coming. Um, if you are not on our email list and you would like to be, there's a table, there's a paper on the table in the back there uh, with instructions of how you can get on our email list if you want to get the monthly updates. If you don't use email and want to be notified by phone, uh, just talk to me directly about that. Or, yeah, uh, we do have a way to get you on a call blast list if, um, if that's something that you want. Um, if you haven't noticed, there's some water in the back. If you're not familiar with the space here, uh, restrooms are either up the hallway all the way around the corner or just down this hallway on the right, there's a uh, there's restroom as well. Um, as you probably know, these are uh, free monthly meetings. We do not charge for these meetings. They are paid for by sponsors. Uh, once in a while, we'll put out a um, donation box, but generally, uh, most of it gets paid for by sponsors. Uh, our sponsors for this year are Jeff Moeller. Jeff is a uh, member of our group, one of our board members actually, and he uh, does some private lending. Joe Liofsky, where's Joe? Joe's here somewhere. Joe's a, a property manager. Uh, Dave Wolf, PMG Mortgage. Uh, Dave is not here, but Dave's son Parker is in the back there. Parker's a uh, real estate agent. Ben Yoesh, friend of mine, local realtor. He's gonna be sharing a bit of a market update for us in just a bit. And uh, Nate Rittenhouse, Lanka Federal Credit Union. Uh, is Nate here tonight? I don't think I saw Nate. Nate's here uh, some of the time. So those are the guys that are paying for the seats you're sitting in. So uh, we appreciate them sponsoring our meeting. Um, so Benuel, as one of our sponsors, is going to uh, talk a little bit. Uh, we started doing here four or five months ago. We started taking a little bit of time at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, what we call a local market update. It can be anything from real estate prices to interest rates to inventory or whatever. Um, so Benuel's going to dive into something uh, here, and uh, I think it's on interest rates tonight, so might have a bit of a discussion around that and take a look at a pretty interesting component of the real estate market right now. So take it away, Ben. Thank you, Jake. Good to be here with you all. Uh, my market update for tonight is going to be just a few words. That is that it has not fallen off a cliff yet. <laughs> Darn it. So not locally anyway. So yeah, I mean, if you're a regular here, you've heard me share the view before that you know, we're pretty insulated. You know, don't sit around waiting to buy. If you see a deal, go for it. But I'm not going to try to make any grand predictions on interest rates, because I've definitely tried that, definitely failed. But this is a chart with that was interesting enough to me to say, hey, let's come share it with the group. Um, so this is a fun one for me. This is about 2015 is where my investing career started. And this is what rates have done since then. I mean, that is a great example of it is better to be lucky than good. Um, just investing in those years and being able to lock in virtually everything we own at the bottom of that spike. So these were some fun years, the 3% money, 3.5% money. And it's fun to have a bunch of assets locked in there. And now it's just a matter of, well, what does that look like when money's at six and seven? Do you wait around? You know, do you hope it comes back down and it's easier to find cash flow again? Do you try to take advantage of deals today? Um, and I'd always be an advocate of taking advantage of them now. But this is a, yeah, it's kind of wild to see all this. Like now that we're back in the, you know, pushing into the sevens and realizing that, well, I mean, that is, you, know, you do have to go back to the really early 2000s to see rates like we had today being normal. And we got close in 06, 07, leading up to the last pullback. But yeah, it's kind of cool to go back you know, 20 years and they would have thought the rates that we have today are good. And that was just because they're based it on you know, their 10 years prior to that, it would have been a few percentage points higher. And then we, we all know what you know, the 80s were like. You had rates pushing 20% for a time. So it's kind of cool to see all of that, and you know, it's 
it is interesting to make a guess at what the trends might look like moving forward. Um, I mean, if you made a wild guess at that, the one unique thing we're facing now is that the rates now are riding, you know, having a few trillion pumped into the system in a really short amount of time. So what happens as that pulls back? And I would guess we see a similar trend as we did from 06, 07 to more recently. I don't know that we'll ever see three and a halves again, but I think it's safe to assume that we're probably going to be lower in a couple years than we are now, but we'll see how that goes. Chad, what do you think on that? <laughs> I, I came to hear what you think. <laughs> that's, that's fair, but yeah. It's hey, look, uh, real quick, I, I think that rates will not go back down to 3% unless there's a major thing like World sure. War type problem. But I think like there's a ton of government debt that needs to be financed. And so I would not be shocked at all if in a year around the presidential cycle we see rates come down. Yeah, because you have an administration that would like to look good, not terrible, going into the next cycle. So there's some motivation there. But, but even, you know, the other piece of that too is we can all think, and I, th I think it's important that we're that we have a handle on what's going to happen in the next year or two. You know, it informs our decisions on, well, do we refinance now or do we wait? Do we, you know, do we actually hold off on buying on some of this stuff? And I think one of the important things to take away from this is if you look at that chart historically, I mean, whether rates are at you know, four and a half or eight percent next year doesn't matter that much as long as you keep buying good quality assets and don't make stupid decisions with what we already own. Um, so. Yeah, it's fun stuff. Fun stuff to guess at. I think it's important to have a sen sense of what the history of this stuff is, so we don't freak out when rates go from three and a half to seven. You know, three and a half was never sustainable. It felt that way for a couple years. It felt like, okay, this is fun. This should be the normal for a while, but it's just not the case. So, it's about what I have on that, Jake. Uh, this is really um, not planned, but Joe, do you have any? Do you have any input on this topic? I feel like you've been investing for longer than many of us in the room. And if you have any thoughts on this, I would love to hear it. Um, come on up. Come on up. And, and I'll talk till you get here. First so you, then you just said, <laughs> this, I've actually looked at this very chart a lot the last couple years. And I've done it in ways where it's like, OK, um, if you, can, you hit, can, you, can you hit one year there? Yeah. So it's all about perspective, really. So, OK, that, uh, they started. So five, five. Yeah. yeah. So based on that, it's like, wow, interest rates have went up a lot. But if you go back to the other one, which I think is 50 years, it's like, well, are rates high or are they not? Um, but the one thing that does matter is the rate of change. And I know there was a bunch of other stuff going on with the market. I don't understand. Well, I kind of understand how prices could stay that stable with this rate increase. But it is really wild. Like that rate, that hike from what some 30-year 30 30 year fix we're going for like two and a half or something. And you're at seven and a half? Like that is wild. That is taking the affordability down a, a lot. I don't know what those numbers are, but. It's a lot. Anyway, what do you think, Joe? What do I think? I'll put him on the spot. Why not? Um, <laughs> the last time there was a big change, I mean, can you go back to 1980, 1979, 80? Right uh, can you go on that t to that year and see what the change was like? Yeah, because yeah, you're right. uh, so that was in that was instead of dumping a ton of um, money and equity into the system, they were take it was kind of being taken out of because the price of oil doubled and tripled. So oil is directly related to everything, and that was during the, uh, the energy crunch. So um, I think that, that th what's going on now is, like you were saying, is the, the dumping of money into it and, and the value of the dollar is less. That was kind of like with the, the petrodollar um, being less. So there's, there's always some dramatic thing that has to happen for it to spike up like that. I think with $30 trillion of debt, I don't think it's going to be able to go a whole lot higher because it's real expensive to pay the debt back. So, you know, that and five bucks will get you a cup of coffee. But I think we're probably going to be somewhere around 6% average, just like it's been. So where we are right now is not, not horrible, you know, not from my perspective. When you're borrowing money in the teens, that's pretty bad. 
So six and seven percent is not horrible. But a bunch of us are going to have to be refinancing from three and a half percent money to six or seven percent money in four or five years, which is okay. It's yeah. Just, yeah. Do you think that's likely the reality? All those things that you hear out there about not being over leveraged. Sure, they're true. And, you know, yeah, that, that's why. You know, you hear Dave Ramsey talk about you know, owning uh, real estate free and clear. Well, there's a reason, because he got burnt really bad. And, you know, for a long period of time, if you were investing from 1980 till for 40 years, you could look like a hero. You know, and it's, it's going, interest rates are going down instead of going up. You know, you could buy a flip and, hold on to it for an extra six months, not know what they're doing and come out better just because of time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's appreciating value and you're, that's kind of going lower. Now it's gonna be the other way around. So I think hit the books, read a little bit about history. That would be my suggestion. So, Joe, I, I would love to hear a little more about the, what happened in the eighties. So you're saying that was a very intentional act by the government to pull the price of oil back down. Uh, well, inflation was just rampant. And sure. there's a problem with inflation now, which is, I think it's still kind of going on. I mean, real estate is still selling, you know, in that three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar range, it's still selling. Sure, but a lot, of, a lot of other stuff is pulling back, though. Yeah. So, yeah. But it takes a while. When that pendulum swings, it takes a while for. If you guys never seen the movie, uh, The Big Short, awesome, awesome movie, but it, it talks about the last crisis in you know seven oh eight. And this, this guy could see the writing on the wall, see what's going to happen, but it just took a long time for the momentum to change. Like mm -hmm. right now, I think people are still in the idea that you could just buy anything and it'll work out okay. And people are still buying. I think I think there's going to be a little bit of a crack. I don't think it's going to be bad, but I think there's going to be a little bit of a pullback. They're just, they're almost has to be. Um, you can't have a change that quick and not have strong sure. Because if you were buying real estate a year, year and a half ago, at three percent, why are you willing to spend a hundred thousand dollars more for that same piece of real estate? And now you're paying seven, eight percent. There is a little bit of a correction. It, it, it's going to get interesting. So, I wouldn't want to be over leveraged because um, things may continue to change. And if they do go up, if they don't come down, if you are counting on being able to always be able to refinance at five or six percent, and if they do creep up a little bit at seven or eight percent, could get ugly. Mm -hmm. Now's a good time, I think, to be. Somewhat conservative as before, I think just you know buying anything, hang on to it. It's going to appreciate in value as long as it's cash. Well, as long as it's cash, <laughs> I can still buy stuff today. But you can get it, a little bit more conservative. Mm -hmm. Get a thirty-year fix at three percent. That's probably always a good idea. Oh, uh, jump yeah. on the money. And if you get owner financing, there's a lot of people that out there that don't really know what's going on. They'll be happy to finance at five percent. They think they're doing really good. Be good, to, you know, lock it in for five percent. Do it. Panel it's good. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe said it might be a good time to be a little bit more conservative, to not be over leveraged. But what does that mean? Does that mean 50% debt to asset? Does that mean 80%? What does that mean? And I don't know what the answer is to that. But getting in a room for people like this, collaborating, trying to stay somewhat on top of what's going on is how you can make those decisions for yourself. Um, because it's easy to say, well, you know, it's a good time to not be over leveraged. But what is that? Nobody's going to say, here's the exact, you know, here's the ideal debt to asset ratio. Because you got anything from the Dave Ramsey approach to doing all cash, which there's proof that that works for some people. And then you got the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, which for those of us that get into real estate investing, we tend to gravitate more towards that side. And, um, so somewhere in between there is a balance, and that position has you know changed for me a little bit, and it'll probably continue to change. So anyway, love those love those discussions. We are going to get rid of the projector, and um, we are going to transition here. We got a couple of light bulbs I can get on here. Okay, let me uh, grab my notes. Oh, you know what? That's why I usually let that thing down. <laughs> Forgot, sorry. You don't want to look at yourselves. Okay, um, so, topic for tonight, safety. 
Who's into some safety discussions? Come on. <laughs> so some of you guys are thinking, what in the world does safety have to do with real estate investing? And honestly, probably nothing until something goes wrong. Then it's got everything to do with it, right? Like the topic of, of uh, safety, it's kind of like, it's something, it, it's a, the, ideally we take proactive measures. It's stuff we oftentimes, especially as young entrepreneurs, we do things and you don't think about the topic of safety a lot until something goes wrong. And then you look back and you know, all of that. Um, but I think it's gonna be a fun, uh, educational, entertaining meeting. Um, my goal as your host of the meeting is to some degree to provide education. Um, it's kind of what, you know, the topic we're on with interest rates. Education is important. Uh, but more importantly for me is to, to provide content with the goal of expanding our minds and broadening our perspectives. Because when we see things differently, we act differently, when we hear different stories, it impacts us in ways that we think differently and our perspectives get broadened. So that's one of our, it's one of our goals here. And I think that's gonna happen tonight. Um, so my brother Sam uh, has been uh, teaching on the topic of safety at a, um, a place called Sturdy Built Manufacturing. Some of you guys may be familiar with, and uh, Sam and I have been talking about this for a while to get him here sometime just to uh, do a presentation in front of this group. So that is finally happening tonight. You're probably going to hear him uh, say this as well, but I think this is, this is really a key point. In almost anything like this, experience is the greatest teacher. But it doesn't always have to be your own experiences. There's a lot of value in learning from other people's experiences. Sam's going to be talking about some of that stuff. We're going to be hearing uh, a couple of stories from Eli. And hopefully, um, if we have time, some stories from you guys as well. So um, we're going to dive right in. How about uh, joining me in uh, giving a big welcome from my brother Sam? Thank you, Jake. I'm excited about this. Thanks for uh, your presentation, Ben. You know, that was, uh, that was interesting. It made me think back um, 1996, we bought our first home. Um, 1.07 acre property on Redwell Road. Um, we paid 107.9 for it. Two bedroom by level in the woods. My, how things have changed. Oh, and our first uh, mortgage, it was with Blue Ball National Bank at 8.1% interest. And uh, we got a lot of education in refinancing because we were refinanced and we were refinanced and we would refinance again and we save more money. But anyhow, it's good to be here uh, and it's good to see you here, and especially since you planned to come, which means you didn't have an incident in traffic on the way here. So that's good. Um, Jake, in case of a fire, we're all going out the way we came in. <laughs> Okay. All right. Good. So uh, the email invitation that Jake sent out said uh, it challenged you if, if you knew he had a brother, Sam. How many knew he had a brother, Sam? Oh, only a few. Okay. Wow. How, how many of you uh, knew that Jake's a runner? Oh, a lot of hands. How many knew that he wasn't always a runner? Okay, good, good. So uh, about 25 years ago, my wife started walking, and she started running, and she would run two, three miles on the road sometimes. And uh, Jake was concerned. He said, man, that's, that's got to be hard on your joints. But uh, <laughs> I think they've improved the shoes. <laughs> All right, so... <clears throat> What we're going to get in here tonight is, is looking at, we're not going to be teaching safety on a certain tool or a, or a certain activity, but more talking about a safety culture and how we can change that and what that means and how our actions affect others. 
Um, so, so thank you for, uh, for, for showing interest in creating um, and maintaining a culture where quality, safety, and production go hand in hand. And you know, you might see signs sometimes where it says, safety is number one here at our company. You know, and the question is, should safety be number one? Um, I don't think so. I think because if safety could be number one, then it could be number two if we forget. But I think, I think our focus should be that safety, quality, and production go hand in hand, and they create an environment where it's difficult to get hurt. It creates an environment where you can produce things safely, efficiently, on time, and correctly. Um, and, and where this, this culture is ever improved because, because we care about what we do and we are thankful for the jobs that we have. Where we recognize the hazards around us and continually strive to improve and to look out for each other. And that's where we're going to be talking about trust. Trust is a huge factor in keeping everybody safe. And to realize that each and every one of us has much value and, and is, a, is a blessing. Um, so why, is, why are we responsible for safety? And I'll, I'll break this down into three different, three different segments. And first of, all, um, first of all, we're responsible because OSHA mandates uh, regulations. And uh, we don't like to hear that word. Um, but who knows what OSHA stands for? Other, yeah? What is it? Occupational Safety and Hazard Association. That's right. Founded it, in 1952. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. No. Because uh, I, I saw that it was founded by Richard Nixon on 428 of 71. And that their, that their budget in 2021 was... 591 billion. That's a discussion for another time. <laughs> so, uh, it's not a fire. <laughs> so, number one is we're responsible to OSHA because they make the laws. Number two, if we work for an employer, we're responsible to them. They say that we need to wear safety glasses or do certain things then that's, that, that's what we're responsible to do, to honor him. And then number three is that we have, uh, we have families waiting for us, um, husbands, fathers. We have people depending on us. We're the providers to come home from work in the evening. There might be a lot of single guys here. You're just as important to somebody. You're a son. You're an uncle. You, you matter. They want to see you come home. They don't want to go see you in the hospital. And I want to say this, too, that, you know, we want to do everything we can, <laughs> but we don't ever want to think that we can control everything because we do, uh, we do live in a broken world where accidents do happen and uh, that are out of our control. And if something does happen, we believe in the sovereignty of God and that he does bring beauty from ashes. But, uh, but we need to understand that, that we are created in his image and to be good stewards we want to be responsible and help those, help those around us. Um, so, so what does that look like? And as Jake said, is experience really the best teacher? Um, and, you know, in this case, it's, it's better to learn from other people's experiences. So what happens when those that depend on us suddenly have to care for us? Um, a personal story I'm going to share was in 2008. We built a new school, and uh, we had seeded the grass, and it come there was a bunch of weeds, and I was down there mowing uh, one afternoon. It was Labor Day weekend, and um, I had a had a Honda mower, and it was one of those that as soon as you release the handle, the blade stopped. You know, you know the kind. And and I'm mowing, and the thing's junking up. I should have had a side discharge, but. It was junking up pretty bad. And so I got to the end, and I idled the engine. I released the handle. I lifted the deck with my right hand, and I reached underneath, and I cleaned out the junk. Made a few more passes. Repeated the same thing again. 
idled the engine, released the handle, lifted the deck with my right hand, cleaned it out with my left hand. Well, what I didn't realize was the bolt that holds the blade brake together had loosened. And when I stuck my hand up in there, I all of a sudden had hamburger. Um, I have all my digits. Um, Dr. Becker put me together really nice again. But luckily I was not there by myself. It was on a Saturday afternoon. And somebody could go for help. They called the ambulance. I had a couple fingers that were hanging. But then the way it affected my family, um, at that time our, our daughter Kate, she was seven years old. Uh, she has an inherited degenerative eye disease. And in low light conditions, she can't see. And so she takes daddy's hand, right? And what was her question when she heard that daddy has stuck his hand in the lawnmower and he's got to go to the hospital now? She said, her first question was, which hand was it? So how's it going to impact me? And, you know, for, for a long time, I thought, wow, I wish I would have thought as we were leaving the school with the ambulance and actually drove past our property to just tell the guys to stop and so that my family can come out and I can say, hey, you know, daddy's fine. I'm, I'm going to be good. Obviously, they wouldn't have seen my left hand. But that was kind of my focus. I wish I would have done that. But so often, we don't actually go back to the incident and own what we did. And that's what I want to do. I don't want to make that mistake again. I don't want to make that mistake again. There's another story that, that impacts me greatly when it comes to safety, and that is um, a number of years ago, we had a, a, a gentleman by the name of Bob Gern work for Best Line Equipment. He was doing forklift training at Sturdy Built. And he shared a story that happened that he was involved in um, when he was a EMT, a volunteer firefighter, out at Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. And he said his very first volunteer fire call, the call came in for a burning vehicle. Adrenaline rushes, you rush the scene. And, oh, no, it's not just a burning vehicle. It's a bucket truck with the boom extended up into the high-voltage lines with a man in the bucket. This is on a Saturday morning. This guy had his own business. He, was, uh, he had got a job to power wash the front of this brick building. His truck set up, boomed out this way, boomed out this way. And he's not a careless guy, but he simply overlooked. That as he was moving to the side, he was getting too close to the high voltage lines. And what happened was his spray from his power wash created a mist, too much of a mist, and it arced. And with that, he slumped forward over his controls, and it just pushed him right up into the high voltage lines. So there they are, <clears throat> trying to get that situation under control. Obviously, the guy has passed. They have to get all the electric company, block off this area, car pulls up. There's a young mother, a couple of children. She's wondering what's going on. My husband was working here in this area today. He said, I had to go back. I had to take them back to the fire hall and explain to them what happened. Like I said, he wasn't he wasn't a careless guy. Started his own business, full energy. He just wanted to get that Saturday morning job done. He had a picnic in the afternoon. So what we do can greatly affect those around us, big time. <coughs> the next thing we want to uh, move into is uh, the bullet point that I called safety hierarchy and risk mitigation. 
And what that does, it looks at various levels of uh, what we can do to stay safe. Um, when we, we think of safety glasses, uh, brought a pair of earplugs, good to have, it's good to have these on, on hand to protect your ears. If we have, if we have time, I'll, I'll be able to share a little bit on, on hearing conservation. But when we break down how to, how to really to be safe, it doesn't start with these things, not at all. So if we have a hazard, what's the first thing? What's the first thing we should do? Remove it. Abate. Remove the hazard if we can. What if we can't? The example I like to use here is a chainsaw. Sometimes we need to use it. A chainsaw is dangerous, right? It's a hazard. It can do some nasty, nasty things to a person. So if we can't remove it, what's the next on the list? The next one is engineering. A lot of safety has been engineered into the chainsaw. You have your anti-kickback features, anti-vibration. You have your chain brake, stop the brake in case something happens. It's still dangerous, right? So what's the third thing? Can I get a guess? What's the third thing on the list? It's not safety glasses. Exactly, procedure, thank you. Knowing how to run it, there's a lot there. Knowing how to start it, knowing how to run it, know how to make your cuts, know what to expect. Don't plunge cut. Much. <laughs> and then the last, the line of defense for you is your safety equipment. Very important, but it, it comes after you've done, you've done all these other steps your safety glasses, your helmet, your hearing protection, Kevlar chaps, good idea if you're running a saw a lot. I, uh, we had um, some friends help me one time, and he's using my Husqvarna chainsaw, and Saturday work frocks, they're the worst. People get hurt. More ambition than common sense. And, uh, and he's going from one log to the next, he steps over a log, and he just brings his knee right up into the chain that's idling. Ha. Huh. Now mama's got to patch the pants, but he's got a he's got a nasty gash on the top of his knee. It's that quick. They have no mercy. None. The next one is how to respond safely if there is an emergency. How many uh, how many first uh, first responders, EMTs? Do we have any here this evening? Thank you. You could probably do this better than me, but this is more for people that, um, that don't have the training. So if there is a situation that you get to, what do you do? And assess. assess. Assess the situation. Try to figure out what's going on. Don't rush into it too much. Who is the most important person at that point, you are. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't help the victim. Who's the second most important person? Your partner. That's right. You look out for him. He looks out for you. It's the buddy system. You're on belay for each other. When are we going to get to the victim? He needs help. Who's the third most important person? Any guesses other than? Any guesses? It's not the victim yet. Who's, who's the, who, who do we have to look out for third? That's right. The innocent bystanders, also known as the stupid people. What's going on? What happened? People care. They, they really do. But, um, and, and us, our community is great for that. Rushing in, trying to figure out what's going on, want to help. Um, and then lastly, of course, you tend, tend to the victim. You help them. Kevin, uh, Kevin Gern put it this way. 
He says, at the end of the day, you want the least amount of body bags on the ground. And where a situation like this is especially true is if there's silo gases or manure pit gases. And that's usually the place where you see um, multi-fatalities where people just rush in to help. And, you know, you can't blame them. If your loved one's in there, why would you not go in to help them? You can't smell the gas, whatever it is. That's why a little bit of training can help us in those situations. What's a near miss? Do you ever encounter a near miss? What do you do? What is a near miss? I like to think of it this way. It's one of those events that when you see it, it almost makes you break out in a sweat. That's a really bad one. There's other things that you're going to encounter that you should stop and talk about um, and break it down. What happened? What could have happened here? Uh, but like I said, there's these situations that are actually a narrow escape that, that you know. You know it could have been bad. And, um, and I want to encourage you, your guys, your partners, whoever you work with, your employees, take that time. Sit down. And you talk about it, whether it's right then, your next safety meeting, whatever works for you. Talk about it. It helps people to process what happened not putting blame on anybody, it helps to establish a culture of safety where, where everybody can go home safe at the end of the day. <clears throat> the next one I have is to lead by example, servant leadership. That's a big one because if they don't see the boss doing it, they're probably not going to do it either. But it is contagious. If you take the lead on it, so will they. It takes time. It takes time to change the safety culture. When I started at Sturdy Build 10 years ago, um, culture was kind of sloppy. I had left uh, another manufacturing company, and we were always used to wearing safety glasses. We go out in the shop. You just didn't do it. You didn't go out there without. And and I go to I go to a sturdy build and it's like man nobody's wearing safety glasses why would I but it didn't feel right not wearing them and then we gradually implemented that change and um, and there's still a few guys that would like to uh, protect their hair more than their eyes but um, you know you can, we can gradually usually get them down because you know, they're not comfortable, or they make my eyes go crazy, or it's the glare. We work with Adamstown Eye Care. We get them in for an exam. Maybe they've got <coughs> something going on in their eye where the glare affects them, and we get them into a special set of eyewear. It's, everybody's got certain needs, and we, we try to fill that. We get them, on, uh, get them on prescription safety eyewear if they need it with side shields. Um, I've seen uh, too many things embedded in people's eyes and it's just not not a not a fun not a fun place to be and then to build trust to work with your men to build trust to create an environment where where it's okay if I say Jake I, I see what you're doing but I don't think that's that's safe and 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 he doesn't get annoyed he doesn't you know it's a good thing when there's that trust there, and we can we can work work with each other, um, and then to engage others in various ways. Um, there's a lot of times after a safety meeting, um, it's it's oftentimes everybody's quiet, you know. But after a fact, somebody will come to me and say, "Hey, you know, I thought of that. I thought of an incident," and they share that, and we build off of that, and uh, and and when they when they're allowed to give their input and they're heard, it it helps it helps uh, helps that they um, that they that they want to give their input and share. Uh, 
I remember my, the first safety meeting I was at. I went with my father. I was a young teenager. And uh, a lot of you know where the country house word store is up uh, Mustard School Road. It's when they built the new one at their current location. Their old location was in on the Byler's Machinery on the farm there. And when they moved to the new location, they had a safety meeting in, uh, in the old store. And, and I still remember it. I still remember being there. And my takeaway from that was just a comment that one of the men made when he opened the meeting that somebody was saying, why do we have to have safety meetings? What's the big deal? When your time's up, your time's up, right? So then they asked this person, well, what if your time's not up? Is it still okay to be careless? And they said, well, no, you should still be careful because if your time's not up, it would, it would hurt. So, so there you go. So. When you're, when you're establishing uh, a safety in a smaller company, it can be difficult uh, because you don't have a designated, you don't have, the, safe, the job of safety isn't just one person. Um, or I'm sorry, it's not just one person's job. It's, it's just part of his job. And so it can oftentimes get pushed back uh, so don't try to do it alone. Have a, a team of guys. And when you brainstorm, as a lot of you guys know, that's why you're here, right? You collaborate, talk about this, talk about that, you come up with ideas. That's when things happen. Communication and consideration builds trust, and trust builds a solid foundation for a safety culture where we look out for each other. We speak freely and we avoid injuries. So if safety isn't number one, what should be number one? Awareness? It says attitude is still number one. To be safe and responsible. Um, it says when polling employees and asking, what kind of coworker with what kind of coworker do you like to work? And it says the answer is always one who takes responsibility for his actions. So we talked about building trust. We talked about looking out for each other. Next thing we want to talk about is is what causes you to act when you see an unsafe act. Just last week, last Saturday afternoon, we're coming home from an event and we're coming out Ridge Road and I see this young man, he's running the weed whacker on the side of, uh, side of the road. No safety glasses. You know, he's probably going to be okay. Hopefully. A couple of years ago, before we were heading out for a full moon run one night, Jake. I was weed whacking, and a uh, piece of the trimmer cord broke off, hit me in the lip, and actually embedded in my lip. You think that hurts? I'm just glad it wasn't in my eye. What would that do? So the question again is, what causes you to act when there is an unsafe act? Is there enough of trust there that you can say, hey, I mean, listen, next time you go to the hardware store, grab a couple extra pairs. Keep them in your truck. If you see somebody weed whacking, give them a pair. Say, hey, I noticed you didn't have glasses. I care about your eyes. You should wear, you should wear these. I remember... <coughs> probably about 30 years ago, I was at Dutch Wonderland with a friend. You know the setting? Have you ever been to Dutch Wonderland? A couple? Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Well, there's the main part, and then there's a bridge going on across the creek to the back part. Okay? And between the trails and the creek, there's a grassy area. 
Today, that grassy area has a fence. The day we were there, it didn't. Somebody parked their stroller on that grassy area with a baby in it. And the stroller rolls into the creek. Some guy sees it, he dives in after it, brings the child out. And everybody, everything's fine, right? So they put up a fence. But that's a reaction. You, he didn't even have to stop and think, should I do something here? Is it going to make me look stupid if I do something? Is somebody going to think I'm being nosy or minding their own business? No, he knew what to do, and he did it. But what causes us to act when there's an unsafe act? And, and I shared this in our safety meeting one time, and one of our men, he shared a story. He was on his bike going through Terry Hill one Saturday morning, and he sees a guy up on the side, field, hill, whatever, slope, and he's, uh, he's cut the tree. <coughs> and he said it, it didn't set well. He said it looked like a dangerous situation, but he said, I kept on going. And, and he, but he said, it bugged me. And he said, a couple hours later, on my way back, the ambulance was there, and they were loading this guy up. He had, he had, as he was limbing this tree, cutting away at it, it rolled over and uh, rolled onto him. And I don't know if the guy was hurt bad or what happened, but um, that was a good discussion that came out of what, the, what we had brought up. So take that home with you. What causes you to act when there's an unsafe act? Where are we, Jake? I'm about at the end of... Uh, I have... I have... Okay. Why don't we let, um, let Eli take some time? And then I have uh, a couple other things I can fill in yet if we, uh, if we need to. And... As we mentioned, it's better to learn from other people's experiences. So if anybody here has something they'd like to share, not just a bloody story, but something that would, that would help to build a safety culture, something, a story that would help somebody, you get a chance to share. Good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to see you here. Uh, so Jake called me the other uh, week or day and asked if I would share some stories, uh, which I like to do generally. Um, but he asked if I wanted to share some uh, some stories about accidents that I was involved in, and I was like, "Well, that you know, that's a little embarrassing, but yeah, I'll be happy to." So that's why I'm here tonight. Um, having a great meeting on safety. And um, so I have two, two stories in particular that, that, I, um, that, that affected me quite personally. And so um, I thought about you know, some of the things that, that occurred and some, some lessons that we could learn. Uh, there was, in both instances, there was you know, just a lot of safety um, safety protocols that just, did, they weren't, they didn't exist at that job. So, um, so yeah, well, let's dive right in. So the, the first one, um, 2008, I was down in Mississippi um, helping rebuild after Hurricane Katrina. Um, we were out of the, we were working out of the Waveland, uh, Mississippi care base. Anybody else down there? in 2005, six, seven, eight. Beautiful place. And I liked it there, so I went there uh, quite a few times. And we were, um, this was a two-week stay for me. We had a, a great week the week before, uh, just working at houses, painting, rebuilding, all the fun stuff. And then had a great weekend with friends. Um, over the weekend, it rained quite a bit. And so Monday morning, we go out to a new job for me. 
And what we're doing that day is, um, so due to the, the storm surge, a lot of our houses were being rebuilt on piers. So these were, um, for this specific job, there were 10 by 10 by 16 foot posts that we were putting into uh, seven foot holes. So as I mentioned, it, w it had rained and not just a little bit. So these seven foot holes were about filled with uh, two feet of water. And there was no sump pump on the job. But we're volunteers, right? So I volunteered to be grabbed by my pant legs and grab a bucket and I would fill the bucket and somebody else would pull it up with a rope or whatever we had. And I would hope that they didn't let go. <laughs> that worked out all right. But that gives you a little bit of an idea of the, uh, the culture that was there that day. We were getting things done. And there's only so many holes, right? So it was muddy. It was a bit slow, but we got it done and we didn't have to go run and get a sump pump and wait around. So we got these holes cleaned out and um, proceeded to hook up to these uh, 16 foot 10 by 10 pressure treated posts that were waterlogged and very heavy. So the first one um, they hooked up to, they, they fastened it to a petty bone with the lift and all that good stuff and due to the mud we got stuck. So we have I want to think it was around 20 posts to set that day, and the concrete truck was coming at whatever time it was coming, and we're not going to call off the concrete truck. So we, um, we look at things, we're like, okay, so the petty bone's out of commission, but we have a skid loader. So we're dealing with 16 foot posts, and we have a, a skid loader. Um, but we figured out that if we fasten it at about, um, nine feet with a chain, we can make this work. So we, we fastened a chain around the post, and um, there were two people that were, that were in charge of the posts. So the skid loader operator, and then the guy hooking up the chain and, and whatnot. And I was, I was done um, emptying these, these uh, post holes of water, so now I was laying out bracing by the holes, getting ready to, to brace these posts. And the skid loader operator um, drives up to this post, and and it gets fastened up by his by his helper, and it's fastened up, and he's got it up in the air, and it's yeah, it's it's going to stay there, and he turns around and revs over to the hole, right, and just the the helper is is coming, but he's not there yet, and the skid loader operator. Um, uh, goes and drives up to the hole, right? And what's, what's his goal? His goal is to put the post in, into the hole. And we had discussed how this is going to get done. So he's going to drive up to the hole, and his helper is going to come along and help put it in. Well, helper was, wasn't around, and so he drives up to the, to the hole and drops the post into the hole. Um, except he didn't, except he didn't. What he couldn't see is that as he lowered the boom, the post swung in on the bottom. There's um, limited, limited sight vision right in front of you on a skid loader. He, he couldn't see that the post wasn't going down anymore, but he dropped the fork and the, the the chain, the forks had been tilted up, and the chain slipped off the post, and he, since the post wasn't gone down, he actually hit the post with the crossbar, the skid loader. So you have this 16 foot 10 by 10 that, um, wish we had a two by four here. Um, I could really show you what happened. But so the post gets knocked over. Um, straight onto my head. I was walking along and I had you know seen seen them, but I just 
kept going. And so, um, so it's interesting to me as I had, you know, seen they're doing their thing, and I remember thinking I sh I should be out of their way. Like I thought I was was good. Um, but the post comes down, hits me on the head, uh, whiplashes my my head, breaks my neck and back, and hits my shoulder, and thankfully throws me. Um, far enough out of the way that the post didn't land on me yet. The first thing I remember, I, I didn't see it coming, but the first thing I remember was everything was dark and there was this tremendous weight on my head. Like everything was just black and dark and there was this tremendous weight on my head and I felt and heard the, the, like I, I knew my I knew my neck and back was broken. The next thing I remember was laying on the ground, and um, and everything is dark and black, and I feel a warm, tingly sensation uh, going down my legs out my arms and I had um, <clears throat> just read a story not long ago about a football player that that had gotten paralyzed and so I thought I knew what happened and I moved my arms and legs except except I didn't they didn't move um, immediately all the guys were there they had all seen it happen and they were trying to you know, communicate with me. I couldn't couldn't breathe. Um, at first, I couldn't open my eyes. Um, after a bit, I, I could open my eyes and communicate communicated with them. I couldn't breathe. I I I just was personally, in my opinion, was that. The breath is knocked out of you. Just relax, and it'll it'll be okay. Except it it wasn't. It didn't come back. I couldn't breathe. And so um, right away, everybody gathered around, <clears throat> and we had a a prayer. They of course called nine one one. But, but I still couldn't breathe, and I was, <clears throat> I was getting test breath. Um, <clears throat> you've probably heard of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> you've probably heard of people saying their life flashed before their eyes. It does happen. I, I thought of a lot of things. <clears throat> Finally, I um, I felt for some reason I felt that I was I was laying down the slope a little bit, laying downhill, and I just felt that if I were elevated, I could I could breathe. Um, so I couldn't really talk, but I whispered, communicated, however it was that I need, I need to be raised. And um, three or four of the men took, took both their hands and, and, and gently elevated me about six inches. And immediately I could breathe. Um, thankfully, they were not EMTs. I don't know what they would have done. Everybody is trained not to touch a, a broken neck and back. And that's that's the proper way to do it, but I had a I had a bigger need than that right at the moment. Um, so what had happened was my neck and back back was broken, and after about five minutes, um, I started feeling pain, and um, and gradually my feeling came back. So I had a spinal cord injury, um, not severed, or I wouldn't be here. 
but um, it was um, the doctors weren't sure if if it was pinched or if it was just from the trauma of the blow. Uh, long story short, I, I did recover, and we um, I'm very grateful for each and every day that I have. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely um, a situation that could have turned out quite, quite different. And so there were just some simple takeaways there. Um, I don't, I don't fault anybody for anything that happened that day. I was, as you know, as guilty as anyone. But just having some very simple safety mindset and procedures could have could have could have helped um, so what are some things that we could have maybe done differently just some thoughts yeah sir so if the, if the operator's unable to see clearly what he's doing she has a spot right that's what his helper was. That's what his helper was. I mean, he was he was also going to help position the post properly as it descends into the hole. But we get things done, and it was you know, it was a lot quicker to just drop it in. Yes, Joe. I think you just said it was a lot quicker to just drop it in. Yes. I think there's a lot of people that are in a hurry to do things. Like, I think that personality when you get things done. I stepped off a roof one time. There was tar paper. It wasn't cut to length, and it was two feet over. Mm. I thought I had two more feet of roof. Mm. It didn't feel real good when I hit the ground. And, yeah. You know, if you just do what you're supposed to do, and maybe slow down a little bit, I think it would be a whole lot less. Accurate. That that is that is very uh, a very effective way of being safer. And, and it's so simple, we, we, we find it easy not to do. That's a great point. Yes? I was in the hospital. I didn't have to worry about the concrete <laughs> truck from that point out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. Like, I assume it came out some point, but it, it, it probably wasn't, it, they probably weren't ready for it on schedule. Yeah. No. No, we, we wanted to, to meet meet that deadline for sure. For sure. And then so that was that was the, the one that was that's still very personal to me. Um, again, I don't I don't just stand up here and, and point at it and say, Well that was, you know, really, really stupid. I you know, it was something that yeah, I think we can take lessons from it. Um, and as Sam mentioned, it was a, you know, kind of it was a volunteer, kind of like a, a, a work frolic type attitude. You know, we were all around there having a good time and working with your friends, and um, so it's, um, yeah, we were having a good time until we weren't. And then, so the second incident was in 2015. By then, I was flipping houses, and I still like to get things done, and. Um, this one was a tree trimming incident. So I was trimming a tree, and I determined that this was not a job big enough to call Martin's Tree Service. Um, like, I have a chainsaw. I know how to use it, and I have a ladder. I don't think Sam likes the ladder part, but um, I have this ladder. And so I, I put the ladder up against the, the, the house roof and climb up. And I do have and regularly use earplugs, but I know I didn't have safety glasses that day. Um, so I climb up the roof with my chainsaw and my hard hat. Oh, oh no, no hard hat. Um, I didn't have a hard hat, of course. And I trimmed some tree tree branches that were pretty close to the roof. Nothing happened. I got off the roof, 
and went around to the front, and there was a tree that was a nice tree, but I just needed trimmed up a little bit, and it wasn't it wasn't that big of a deal. So about 15 feet up, we had a horizontal branch coming out, and this one was maybe 10 inches or something. And then we had off that branch, we had a five inch branch that was coming off the other side. And it was just getting too close to the ground. Like it was in the front of the house. And I was like, just just trimming that branch off would really you know, help clean this up. I had done some other trimming as well, which you know, this was kind of the big one out front. So it was just a five inch branch, not really that big. And I set up my ladder against the big branch and then my plan is, so I climb up the ladder and just reach over the ladder, you know, and, and, like, and like cut it. Well, I'm not a tree trimmer every day, or I probably would have done things differently. Um, but so I, I'm, I'm here with my chainsaw, and so I get up there and I cut the branch. Does anyone, does anyone see any problems? I had thought about that. That's a common one, but I wasn't going to be cutting. I had I had my ladder about a foot over, and this 10-inch branch, I was maybe three feet away from the trunk, so I didn't think there was going to be that that snap effect. But yeah, so good thought for sure. That's exactly what happened. I had thought, well, I'll just cut it quick, and then it will drop, right? Well, it was a great plan, but I was even in too much of a hurry to undercut it. I didn't undercut it. And the branch, I wasn't apparently quick enough because the last, like, inch just hung on, and my ladder was positioned, I thought, pretty safely to handle a little bit of that. But the branch came down and just moved the bottom of my ladder. And all of a sudden, I was hanging over the branch, the 10 inch branch, with, with no ladder. <laughs> and the chainsaw is revved up. <laughs> and I was desperately trying to hang on to this chainsaw because A, I was afraid if I let go, it would tear into me going down, or B, it would get on the ground before me and I would land on it. <laughs> and I was not able to keep, keep myself up there. Like, I have I'm not sure if there's scars there to prove it or not, but they were brush burns, and they were, I was serious. But I couldn't keep it up there. My main focus was the chainsaw, because I knew if that got in my face, it was going to be a bad day. So I, that was my big focus. And so as I realized I'm not going to hang up there anymore, I, I, I was able to throw the chainsaw away. Well, by then, I was two inches away from the ground and didn't have time to properly position. Landed on the, on the branch that I had just cut, and I didn't land nicely, so it rolled my ankle and just broke it all, like, all over the place. A really nice spider web break, like, three quarters of the way around, just like, you know, little spider web the whole way around. And, um... Thankfully, my workers had heard everything and seen it came right to me, but I couldn't walk. I was I was done for I was done for the day. <laughs> so that was it's it's pretty embarrassing, but that's yeah that's my story. Um, so one of the first things I did, and I could have avoided this completely if I just had a this was fif fifteen feet, so I could have had a pole saw. I could have had, you know, somebody with a, a rope to make sure the branch doesn't swing down. I could have done a lot of things. 
but I was in too much of a hurry. And yeah. From from then on, I called them a lot quicker. But I also bought a pole saw. I don't get close to those branches anymore. I just I can't do it. So that's one that I remember. Um, any any further comments or thoughts or um, stories there? Yes. So if you were in charge of ten youngsters on a something like that, what, and you were the old guy that had to keep them safe, what would you do? What would you tell them that would actually be effective? Well, that's a tough one. I don't have ten young ones, so I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I would tell them my story. I don't know if they would care, but I would tell them my story. Yeah, Abner. There, there would be a discussion on safety before we get started. Yeah, there would definitely be a, a discussion on safety. And there are some things you don't forget, and that's yeah. Those are those are definitely some of the things I don't forget. Yeah. So yeah, that's about all I have. Um, uh, yeah, we'd welcome further comments or thoughts there, but I'll turn it back to Sam. That experience is free for you. Uh, take it, put it to good use. Um, one of the questions that was brought up here is what do you do if you're in charge of those 10 youngsters? It's tough in an environment like that. Um, one of the things that we do is we give everybody the authority to stop work. If they see an unsafe act, pull out the stop work card, not an actual card, but we tell our guys, all you guys have the ability to do that stop work and everybody stops and they gather around I don't know if they've ever done it even but it's good to think about it so in a case like that that you mentioned it's like you know we, we can't go on we can't go on like this you try to try it on and take a break What's, oh, that, that's a good one <laughs> no I don't think that would work there's a uh, Hearing conservation is one that's that is uh, that I like to talk on a little bit, and and it's one that you know it's not like getting a piece of steel or a piece of wood in your eye. It's not going to put you down immediately, but when we realize how our ears work, it's fascinating, and we get into the habit of wearing earplugs or earmuffs and protect that. Um, so the, the, the sound waves enter our ear. We have the outer ear, which we can see. And then there's the center ear. And then there's the inner ear. And of, our, of the senses that God gave us, he put some pretty intricate detail into our ears. How many of you knew that there's mechanical components in your ear that actually move and rattle and vibrate together? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? There's three little bones in there. They, they, there's other names. They call them the hammer and the anvil and the stirrup. So vibrations, by the way, it's working right now. They enter your ear. They're gathered by your outer ear. It's channeled in through the eardrum into the center ear or the, yeah, the center ear. And these little bones rattle together. Um, we kind of tend to refer to a pleasing sound. We call that sound. But if it's not pleasing, we call it noise. Um, and when those all vibrate together, then, this, then it's transmitted to the inner ear. The, the, it transmits the vibrations generated by the sound to the inner ear. It says the inner ear contains a snail-like structure called the cochlea, which is filled with the fluid and lined with cells with very fine hairs. These microscopic hairs move with vibration and convert the sound waves to nerve impulse 
<coughs> and the result is the sound that we hear. Um, I'm sure you've all, well, I hope not, but very likely a lot of you guys have shot guns without um, hearing protection. You get that ringing in your ear. That's, they would call that uh, temporary tintinitis. Um, but what happens, there's actually temporary damage in there. And there's tiny hair-like nerves that, that they, they bend and they grab that, those vibrations and transmit that sound into your brain. What happens if there's too much noise, they get flattened out. It's like you drive across the yard with your car. The grass goes down, right? Well, you know, next week it might be okay again if it rains. But if you continuously drive across that area, it's going to kill it. It's not going to stand up again. And, and you, that's how it happens with, with, uh, with sound and the damage in your ears. Um, who can tell me, <clears throat> so noise is measured in decibels. Who can tell me what, uh, what a safe measure is of, of sound? 80, 80 is that's pretty close. 80 is a little bit high, um, but at at um, at 80, um, it might be good for I don't know <coughs> four or six hours before damage occurs. Um, at 80 decibels, they that's like a garbage disposal or a dishwasher, or average factory or a freight train. Um, and the interesting thing is, it's the, the decibel range is like, um, it's not like 140 is twice as much as 70. It's, it's uh, 80 is twice as loud as 70. So it, it really increases as, as the sound increases. And, uh, and that's, when, that's when damage can, can occur. So that, uh, it's, it's worthwhile to take care of your hearing so that you can hear when your wife talks to you, when your grandkids talk to you. Um, and once you get in the habit of wearing ear protection, you don't want to do without. So it's a good, uh, good practice to, uh, to be in. <clears throat> Who can tell me the name of the African-American woman that's on the, our quarter for 2023? Anybody? Bessie you got it. Good job, Jacob. Do you know who Bessie Coleman is? No? You, you don't? So, Bessie Coleman was, wait, where are my notes here? She was born in, uh, in 1892. And she was not okay with being just the normal Bessie Coleman, working in the fields, working in the factories. Um, she wanted more. She wanted adventure. And, and so Bessie Coleman became an aviator. She flew an uh, airplane. And there was nobody in the United States willing to train her. So I think she went to France to get her schooling. And she flew a biplane, a stunt plane, and she would perform stunts for people. Uh, she was a daredevil. Um, but what happened to Bessie Coleman was when she was uh, 34, <coughs> She bought a plane in Texas, um, and her, her manager flew it from Texas to Florida. The plane was so poorly maintained, he had to make a couple landings along the way, and her family did not want her to fly because they said, it's not safe, don't do it. Um, but she didn't listen. So the next day, they went out, kind of a practice run. Her mechanic was driving. She was in the other seat, open cockpit, I'm sure, probably no seat belt. So they're going out, and she has a parachute jump scheduled for the next day, and she wants to see the landscape and the terrain. So they're going up about, I have to read the article, maybe about 10 minutes into the flight, the plane nosedives, and it spirals. And somewhere along the line, she's thrown out. So she dies, the plane crashes, but what they discovered was 
throughout the burnt wreckage, they discovered that a wrench was left on the engine and it jammed. And that's what took it into the spin. They weren't able to bring it out. And uh, that was the, the cause of the cause of the crash. Um, and, you know, so what's the big deal, right? You're working on your car and you leave a wrench there and you lose a 9 16th wrench, you can get another one. But it depends where you're working. If you're working at Sturdy Bill and you're doing maintenance on a laser or a linear punch, um, you better be careful. You better know where all your tools are <coughs> so that when this machine starts up again, you're not crashing something. Um, or if you're an airplane mechanic, you want to know where all your tools are. If you're a surgeon, you probably want to make sure you know where all your tools are. <laughs> Never found it. The car burn? Okay. Yeah. Did you ever see a car burn? Man, cars burn. Man, everything burns. There was um, where we, where it's sturdy built is we can see up to 222. And um, uh, last summer we look out and there's a car. It's pulled off to the side and it's just burning. And it's like, I don't know, it's, is there that much plastic in a car? They just burn. And People are pulling off, and somebody comes running with a fire extinguisher, and about a minute later, the thing's empty, and it's right back up to burning. And the tires are blowing, and, yeah, they, they, just, they cook up fast. They cook up fast. It seems like, I don't know, everything burns. Yeah, fire extinguishers. I can't stop one car one night, and it was burning, and I had to do fire extinguishers. Good job. Good job. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm struggling here a little bit. Uh, so is there anybody else here that wants to share any incidences? I want to share a win um, for using safety. Yeah, come on. Good job. One time we were down in Philadelphia somewhere working on one of these tall buildings. We had a 135 foot lift. We took it all the way up, jet up there that day. And that was only at a little level. I don't know how tall this building was. This was one of my first meal running jobs I ever did. And um, it's lunchtime. And the guy in charge of the job comes to me and the friend who jumped me the job. They started walking towards me. I'm like, this is not good. We were trying to finish the roof that morning. There was one lift on the job. And there was white hats everywhere. I mean, we were drummed down with safety that day. It was crazy. And he said, we're going to grab a hold of your leg on the arm. Um, on one side, the other one on the other side, and I was tied off, and it left me down over the roof with all these safety hats watching, and we never got shut down. We all went home that night. We weren't happy about the safety, but we all went home. It was fun. We're tied down over. Just like you were doing with the bucket. Anybody else have anything to share? All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up <coughs> with a poem. <coughs> this is by Don Morrell. I don't know who he is, but uh, uh, apparently his experience impacted me enough to pen some words. And, uh, and it goes like this. 
The title is, I Chose to Look the Other Way. He says, I could have saved a life that day, but I chose to look the other way. It wasn't that I didn't care. I had the time. I was there. But I didn't want to seem a fool or argue over a safety rule. I knew he'd done the job before, and if I spoke up, he might get sore. The chances didn't seem that bad. I'd done the same, and he knew I had. So I shook my head and walked by because he knew the risk as well as I. He took the chance, and I closed an eye, and with that act, I let him die. I could have saved a life that day, but I chose to look the other way. He says, now every time I see his wife, I know I should have saved his life. That guilt is something I must bear, but isn't something you need to share. If you see a risk that others take that puts their health or life at stake, the question asked or thing you say could help them live another day. If you see a risk and walk away, then hope you never have to say, I could have saved a life that day, but I chose to look the other way. To create a culture where it's difficult to get hurt, to create a culture where trust, trust is so important. If you're free to, to walk up to your coworker, whoever it is, and say, look, I, uh, I see what you're, what you're doing. It, it just doesn't look safe. I feel free to do that, and, I, and I'm confident that you're going to respond accordingly. And I guess if, even if you don't, it shouldn't matter. But, uh, but trust is huge. Trust is huge. Um, I think trust is huge in the investor's market. You guys build relationships, and relationships are all about trust. And um, so I'll leave you with that. Thank you for your input, and uh, have a good evening. Another quick story that I'll share. <clears throat> Hadn't even thought about this until uh, Sam was sharing uh, this evening here. But um, a friend of mine, a runner by the name of James Weaver, a few of you probably know him, um, had an incident uh, a couple of years ago that was uh, pretty, pretty dramatic. He was uh, working for a landscaper and uh, riding a, a zero-turn mow or something like that and on a very, very steep uh, embankment. And on this particular time that he was doing it, uh, the grass was wet, and he realized that this is really, really just not safe. Um, and, he did, and he made up his mind in that moment that once he, if he, he would finish this job, but he wasn't going to do it again like that. But that wasn't quite enough. He, um, I don't know exactly what happened, but apparently there was like, anyway, the mower started sliding. Uh, sliding out of control, and apparently it was a situation where it got worse rather than better because he knew that he staying on was not going to be an option. So he 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 doesn't know exactly what happened um, in this sequence, but he tried to jump off, and he thinks somewhere along the line some article of clothing probably got caught on something, which kept him from totally freeing himself from the mower. I think the mower flipped over, and as bizarre as it sounds, he ended up getting his elbow stuck in the discharge chute of the mower, and his elbow got stuck directly into the blades. When it all calmed down, he was laying there. He knew he, knew he was hurt badly. He was bleeding pretty seriously. He, I forget exactly how this was. He explains it very much in detail where his phone was in his pocket, and so he was trying to figure out how he was going to get to his phone to dial 911. And he was in a very, it was a very awkward position. He was very limited with what he could do. He finally got his phone out of his pocket, got, tried to call 911, and the call failed once or twice, I think. So he's, as he's talking about this, it's a very impactful story. He's laying there, and he literally thinks he's going to die. He's bleeding out, and he, he thinks he's going to die. The farm he was working on 
I don't know the setting, but apparently there was a driveway close by, and um, a Mexican worker by the name of Angel saw him and called 911, and they got into the hospital, and he lost his arm, um, but he survived. Uh, he's still a runner. He's still faster, a lot faster than I am, um, but it's just really impactful hearing him talk about that story. Um, it's just another one of those things. So anyway, hopefully that was helpful. That's a lot of food for thought. Um, and, you know, a lot of this stuff, we talk about habits in many areas of our lives. Habits, maybe it's reading so much a day. Maybe it's getting up at a certain time in the morning. Maybe it's whatever it is, journaling. Maybe it's whatever. We're just creating um, a habit of wearing safety glasses or wearing earplugs or doing these things. A lot of it can be... Um, can be pinned down with a good habit. And it's not just about me or about you, but it, that affects all the people around you. So anyway, we're going to wrap it up for tonight. Um, I am going to announce a speaker that we have coming for August because uh, it's kind of a big deal. Um, in two months from now, uh, we have Dave Kaufman from Florida that's going to be coming up to share with the group. Um, Dave speaks on a number of topics. He's most well known for um, a disc, uh, disc personality uh, profile trainer. Actually, he's going to be at Houston Run down in Gap on Friday, an all-day event that they're doing, Michael Manthe, uh, a couple guys. So anyway, Dave is going to be coming up. Um, if you've never, if you've never um, heard Dave speak, or especially on that topic, I think you'd find it very interesting. Um, he is a what they call a master trainer, which I'm not sure what is. Actually, one one of ten in the world uh, at what he does. So he's a very uh, captivating speaker. We're planning on um, actually um, renting two rooms that night. Uh, probably have a uh, expecting a, a much bigger crowd than our normal meetings. From so that's August August second. <coughs> um, I think that's it. We're going to wrap it up for tonight. Uh, again, thanks for coming out. Hopefully you got some value out of this. Hang around. Talk to Sam. I don't know how long he'll hang out, but I'm sure he'd be happy to talk one-on-one -on -one as well. Uh, meet some new people. Make some connections. And um, we'll see you back here first uh, Wednesday evening in July. Thanks again for coming out.